All right, there it is. Folks, uh, grateful that you are joining us, whether you're watching this live or whether you'll watch this after uh, we end this broadcast. I'm sitting here, I'm Bill Real, uh, Executive Director of Mormon Discussion Incorporated, and I'm sitting here with Jacob Hansen. Uh, Jacob and I uh, had planned to do kind of a conversation uh, quite a while back. Uh, that didn't happen probably on my end, um, but recent uh, weeks, I joined a Facebook group that uh, Jacob uh, is an admin over in the conversation there. One of the folks suggested that Jacob and I get into a conversation and I, I reached out to Jacob and tried to put this together. And here we are. Um, folks may not know either one of us. Certainly folks who follow you may not know me and vice versa. So Jacob, I'll give you a moment to introduce yourself and to share any thoughts about who you are uh, before we uh, dive into the conversation. Yeah, perfect. Thanks, Bill. Um, so yeah, just so anyone who doesn't know who I am, uh, my name is Jacob Hansen. I have a YouTube channel called Thoughtful Faith. I also have a website called thoughtful-faith.com. Also, just so that your listeners know, I did not know about the channel A Thoughtful Faith when I started mine. So I have no association with that, but it was yeah. genuinely something I found out about later, but I'd already gotten the logo and everything else. So <laughs> it, it is, it right. is what, what it is. Um, cookies, that's right. <laughs> so anyway, but, um, yeah, just a little bit about me. So I'm a lifelong member of the church. Um, my mom's a convert. I served a mission in Argentina. Um, I graduated from BYU, Hawaii. Uh, I also just but kind of on a side note, just so I'm not totally in the a Mormon bubble. Um, I grew up in Reno, Nevada. So uh, went to actually went to public schools, private schools, evangelical schools, um, and I graduated from a Catholic high school. So I've had a lot of exposure to other faith traditions. Uh, grew up being challenged pretty heavily on my faith um, by by a lot of different people. Um, anyway, then I uh, served a mission. Graduated from BYU Hawaii, met my wife there. We got married. We have four kids. And then uh, as far as the church goes, um, I have been mainly serving with the young men's program um, for about the last decade. Um, served in uh, Bishop Brick as well um, and got into this whole kind of podcast game uh, just about in the last year or so. And uh, I've had a lot of listeners up to about uh, almost 8,000 subscribers now. So been been cool to to get to know a lot of different people doing this sweet sweet and uh, uh bill real here i joined the church as a 17 year old i'm 44 years old today um when i was 29 years old i became a bishop of the ward that i had converted to while as a sitting bishop at the age of about 32 i had uh, a faith crisis deconstructed my faith also deconstructed uh christianity and and the idea of a literal uh, Jesus uh, ended up being excommunicated from the LDS church, but I had already gone inactive as a non-believer, but got excommunicated for the podcast that I do, where I try to shine a light on what I perceive as the unhealthiness within the LDS uh, leadership in the faith. And uh, really enjoy you know, these kinds of conversations where we can kind of talk at length about issues. And I'm really appreciative, Jacob, that you came on. Um, the topic today is morality, and uh, our goal today, I think there's twofold goal, at least on my end, and feel free to state anything different if there's something on your end, but on my end, it's for us to show the audience that we can have a, a congenial, amicable conversation where we're kind to each other, and where both of us have expressed that we really do want to understand how the other side puts this issue together. And uh, we also want to present this in a way that our audience can essentially have access to a good, healthy conversation around morality, and they can then be informed and make uh, decisions based how uh, decisions um, on how they'll kind of frame this idea or this issue. And I'm really excited to get into it. So I wanted to give you a moment to start to present kind of how you would want to initiate this conversation on morality. And let's kind of see where it goes from there. Yeah. Um, so one thing that, you know, a Latter-day Saint like me who sees channels like yours uh, that are very critical of the church, mm -hmm. um, that, you know, talk about how unhealthy the church is, it it comes across as, as very much the church is doing immoral things, right? And for 
for those within a faith tradition, kind of the basis of your moral system, ultimately, is rooted in that uh, religious tradition, right? Um, there's some sort of a moral philosophy that's rooted in, in what the religion teaches you. For those who are outside of it, you know, I look at it and I go, okay, so you've left the church, you've deconstructed, you know, Mormonism in particular, um, deconstructed Christianity, and then deconstructed even deconstructed theism. Um, and so it's kind of like, okay, what you're left with essentially is that we are animals, right? Um, I would, I would use, um, you know, I know that you're a fan of uh, Yuval Harari's book, Sapiens. Sapiens. Mm -hmm. I, I read that book as well. I, I think it, it brings a lot to the table. And, and, it's, and it sums up a particular type of worldview that views us essentially as, um, as animals. As, uh, and even, even more, if you want to deconstruct even that conception of it, we're, we're essentially chemical reactions in the cosmos, playing ourselves out over time. Mm -hmm. is, is, that, is that an accurate way that, that you would say that you frame sort of our who we are as, as human beings. Yeah. That we are a species that is evolved from something lesser. And over time that started 13 point something billion years ago with the big bang and that we are just one more creature on this planet, uh, trying to survive. Yeah. And, and I guess when I, when I look at that sort of a, uh, a framework, um, and then I, I hear you say things like, um, and I've heard you in, a, in another podcast talk about there being like harm, right? Like do no, don't, don't cause harm to other people. Right. Yeah. And, and, and would you say that people have an obligation that people are obligated to, um, to follow that, that rule? Like, do they have a moral obligation to, to not harm other people? Yeah. So because suffering hurts, because trauma causes people to be affected in ways that uh, that they are impacted throughout their life with uh, negative feelings, neg negative um, ways of dealing with experiences and moments. Uh, I would certainly say that yes, like I, and I kind of sense where you're going. I I would say that I want folks again, me individually. I want folks to have the best, healthiest most uh, beneficial life experience that they can. And I want to do as much as I can to reduce suffering and pain and trauma in the world. Yes. Okay. Um, and, and so I, I guess, is that just your, is that just a preference that you have? Or is that something, because, you know, like I, pre and, and by the way, just so you know, <laughs> just so everyone knows, like, I agree with that. Like, I want people to, to have, to, to minimize suffering and to maximize well-being. Yeah. I'm, I'm a big Sam Harris fan, by the way. Um, obviously not of all the things that he says, but his moral landscape book, I think, is one of the most influential books on me for me kind of orienting the nature of the moral discussion and moral philosophy mm -hmm. generally. Um, mm -hmm. So my, my thing is this. So if um, we talk about, you know, you want to minimize suffering, but what if, and you want to maximize the well-being of other creature or of other yeah. of other other mm -hmm. human beings, let's say. Yeah. Okay. Um, I guess my my question is, is on what basis is anyone obligated to care about the well-being of of not only any other human, but other animals or the planet or those kinds of things, if it doesn't benefit them, if if sort of my well-being is the ultimate purpose of my existence then isn't what moral is that which brings me well-being? Like, wh where's the connection to the other people? Yeah, I think, again, it's been the prime directive of life on this planet to perpetuate itself, to pass along its genetic code. And in order to do that, every species that's had the ability finds ways to collaborate um, and to work together and to protect each other. And um, every species has accomplished that in various ways. And some of them are actually kind of the opposite of that, like insects that the female eats the male, for instance, right? Like there is this contrary morality that happens in the animal world. Um, but most species look out for their own and they try to support each other. 
it, to the to the degree that we have, and again, I won't maybe probably get into this later on, but that there are animals out in the animal kingdom that have a form of morality in spite of having no religious belief. And and so I'm I would simply say that um you're trying to get at like where does morality come from for anybody outside a religious perspective? And I would say it's a natural outgrowth of evolution, and it's a natural outgrowth of every species over whatever hundreds of thousands of years or millions of years trying to perpetuate itself and trying to survive. Okay. So, so if it comes from, if it's a natural, so you're saying that, that morality comes from the natural order of our desire to survive, right? For yes. and to propagate our collaboration, genes. uh, empathy, um, fairness. Yes. But, but I would, I guess I would wonder though, is that, is is this any different than sort of the social darwinism sort of idea i mean isn't is that is there any distinction that you make between social darwinism and sort of that sort of a worldview and and your own sort of way that you frame morality so um i agree that we're in a space where essentially there's no way for any one person to determine what is exactly right or exactly wrong. I absolutely think it to a degree is Darwinism. Um, but I also think that's what we're left with because I don't believe there's a God. And so I'm perfectly comfortable going like, hey, we all recognize, I don't say we all, most of us, the majority of us all through time have had a pretty good gauge for what is hurtful to other human beings and what is not. And I actually find that uh, presupposing that there's a God and placing morality in him actually ends up with us doing more harm to each other than if we're left to our own intuition to collectively agree or disagree on that. Okay. And and I, and, and frankly, that, that that's something that I think you bring up a good point. When you vest God as ultimately the standard of morality, it then becomes, you know, God doesn't become moral. You can't say that God is good. God is amoral. He's outside of morality because he's the standard by which morality is judged. And in fact, that's one of the major criticisms I actually make of kind of traditional Christians because their view, uh, which is different from the Latter-day Saint perspective, is that morality, it's kind of divine command theory or, or I don't, not divine, they either is divine command theory or there is what we would call, um, it's sort of divine nature theory that God is the good and what we call good is God. Now there's various issues with that, but mm -hmm. I frame it the way that you do. And I think that I actually think the Latter-day Saint perspective would frame it this way as well, is that the reason God is good is because he brings about well-being to, to people, right? That's the yeah. re otherwise if he brought us, if, if all God did was bring us suffering, well then why would we call God good? <laughs> You know what I mean? and can I make just a, a little uh, a little caveat here, which is that anytime we suggest that God is giving us morality, what we really mean is that there are outside authorities who we place trust in that we deem them to be able to discern what God is giving, and they've told us what God's given us as a morality. Well, that, that certainly, yes, if if you indeed ascribe to some sort of an outside authority that can give you that sort of uh, revelation, right? If you if you don't, I mean, yeah. if a, a person can have a, a sense of spirituality that God is telling them what's right and wrong, right? But then again, whether it's God or in your case, you believe that it isn't God that's giving you your moral intuitions, it's nature that's giving you your moral intuitions. Yeah, but what I'm, what I'm saying though is that Whereas you feel things or think things, you determine that that comes from God. And there's no way to really measure that or work with it because it's completely internal to you. And the other side of the coin is that anything that is outside of you, written on sacred canon, part of a belief system taught by your leaders, is an outside source that isn't God that you trust to be the voice of God or to discern his will. Okay. And then, but, yeah. but. Your morality, though, you would say it still comes into you based on your own yeah. feelings given to you by nature. Yes, and backed to some degree by science or research, 
by what seems to benefit human beings the most, either through anecdotal data or through uh, observation of uh, data that's presented in a professional scientific way, right? Okay. So now, yep. the, the, now you do seem to be operating from a particular presupposition, and maybe I'm I'm wrong here. But there's a presupposition that that which is moral is that which promotes essentially the most good for the most people. Is that is that is that a fair summation of kind of the moral map? Um, no, because we live in a patriarchy where certain groups of people have privilege. And just because the majority of people get to distance themselves from the uh, trauma that comes just by being a human being and going through life, just because some human beings have the ability to distance themselves from that and by because of their privilege, place that trauma on other human beings, I'm not of the mind that we make all decisions based on the collective good because it might be necessary for 80% of the population to take a 5% hit in trauma that they should have gotten anyway, rather than being able to pass it off to the other 20% simply because of privilege. Okay. So no, I don't I don't think that. So so you would say then individuals like it doesn't matter what the collective wants, individual human beings have like you can do what's not in the ultimate well-being of the group in order to help particular individuals. Like the individuals have rights? Yeah. So let's say for instance, um Let's go back to the Middle Ages, and you've got a small town, and there's one church in the town. And 80% of the people are happy with uh, their life as they know it. Uh, one person is there pushing back against the uh, religious mores of that community, and that person's burned at the stake. Now, that might be the better good for the collective, but no way in hell does anyone have the right to take that person against their will and and uh, burn them at the stake simply because they believe differently than someone else. So th the trouble is once I threw out God, this world becomes complete chaos um, and, and, and it's much more complex and not black and white in any way. And so every one of these decisions, it's not like we go like, oh yeah, here's the decision and there's the line and this is right and that's wrong. Rather, this is all really complicated stuff and decisions uh, about right or wrong uh, take a whole lot more than just saying the collective good, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I, I agree with it. I just, I'm, I'm yeah. curious by what standard you say that an individual human being uh, can't be sacrificed for the betterment of the tribe on kind of a, a yeah, Darwinistic, just... on, on a Darwinistic perspective. No, you you do sacrifice those who are a detriment to the tribe in order that the tribe may thrive, and and people don't have rights. That's a myth. That's as Harari would say that yeah, people have rights. Mm -hmm. And so, it 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 just seems strange to me that you would say that. Um, like, I guess my question would be like, what do you mean that human beings have rights? Yeah. So you're you're um, you're putting me in a place where, and I agree with you. By the way, it would be beautiful if we lived in a world where we could, with some degree of certainty, know that there is a God, know that God is good, know which system exactly that God is advocating, and to know that the authorities in that system have the ability to pick up on God's mind and will and to deliver it to us in its pure form. So that we can know for sure that, hey, God's leading the universe, he's good, and we know for sure the rules that he's given us are good as well. The trouble is that, that again, for a lot of us on this planet, one, there's a lot of us who don't believe in God at all, and two, there's a lot of the rest of the folks who only agree that either one system's right or they can't figure out which system is. And um, so what you're left with if there again, if we if we presuppose there is no God and that all religious systems are delivering uh, a hit or miss moral code, then what we're left with is uh, the general goodness of humanity, which is based in the fact that over millions of years, 
we uh, seek to survive, perpetuate our species, and that requires collaboration. It requires empathy. It requires reciprocity. And uh, that's might, what we're left with. Might it, yeah, yeah, might it require the sacrifice of those who are not of a benefit to the tribe? Um, there are moments in time where uh, the moral code was probably much harsher. It certainly was. If an older person, if a senior in your group could no longer move at the pace that the rest of you needed to, to stay in front of the other tribe that was chasing you down, then you had to essentially sacrifice them, right? Whether you left them behind or yeah. whether you killed them intentionally. But we live in the modern moment of 2023 in a modern world, and we ought to work towards creating a world that is kind to each other, that promotes individual well-being, and allows people to have the healthiest, best life possible without concern exactly for whether a uh, system most benefits rather than the individual. Okay. And that's, again, it's my personal opinion. I don't, I don't and have a, and I guess, I don't I guess have a that's, lawgiver giving me that. I guess that's, that's, that's my opinion. I mean, if it, if it is ultimately just your opinion, um, yeah. kind of you have an opinion and then mm -hmm. other people have different opinions of the way sure. that they want to structure society. The way yeah. I, you know, it would seem that it's just a conflict of different groups. Like, are you, are you, are you implying that your morality and your moral code, this sort of that you're talking about, the sort of universal human rights and all that kind of stuff, are you saying that that is superior to that of maybe other ancient cultures, like ancient indigenous cultures that you know engaged in human sacrifice and had very different moral codes and 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 hierarchical structures? Are you saying that your kind of modern way of looking at the world is a better moral code than theirs? Um, I mean, you had cannibals and yeah, things yeah, like no, that. Totally. But and and so you wouldn't you wouldn't say that yours is better? Because all of this is subjective, because, and, again, and by the way, I agree with you. If there was a God and he picked his system and he gave his code and the people who could hear that code, who were the authorities in that system, could deliver it perfectly, we would by far be better off if that was true. But because that's not true for me, because that's not true, we have to do the best we can. Mm -hmm. And the best we can is to have the best of intentions for other people and to try to make decisions based on, I don't wanna do any intentional harm. I don't wanna cause any unnecessary trauma to someone else. And I want to make it safe for people to be their best healthiest selves. And, and that's a, again, a complex conversation that is entirely subjective. And I am saying that in 2023 with my, uh, more worldview, because if we go back in time, the folks you're suggesting like, hey, Bill, do you have a better code than the Incans or whatever? The reality is anytime there is a small group that isolates themselves within tribalism, ethnocentricity, and they are us's versus them's, the rules are always going to be set up to preference the us's and to always uh, make bad the them's. And the further we get away from ethnocentricity, the more that we can create a world system that values everyone rather than insiders over outsiders. Okay. And, and so I would say that in 2023 with, uh, again, I think we'll be better off 300 years from now, uh, unless systems break down dramatically and we go back to sort of a hunter gatherer society. Right. But as long as we keep progressing, I think we will continue to, move forward in valuing individuals over uh, systems. And, and I think uh, that, again, long as systems stay in place enough that they don't break down to, again, hunter-gatherer, I think that's beneficial for human beings. Okay. No, and that, and that's, yeah. and, and, and so let, let me kind of steel man what you're saying there. You're mm -hmm. saying that over Please. time, as we gain let's say, not to use a gospel term to trigger people, but kind of greater light and knowledge, better understanding yeah. of, yeah. of the universe. We More science, more data, more research, more... Under, yes. And that the light of truth actually allows for us to make moral progress. Is that yeah. kind of the way you're saying it? Totally. And for example, by the way, um, 
human beings, when they have to fight a little bit to survive, they actually tend to be happier than if they have a ton of time to just sit around and do nothing, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so we might in our heads 200 years ago go like, man, it would be really nice. And of course, half of the kids today are doing this very thing where they kind of lounge around and, and kind of uh, spend their time a certain way. And there's a lot of depression or sadness, right? And so as we get further into data, we ought to adopt, Yale does a course on how to be happy. Mm -hmm. And uh, that course is free for anybody to take. They're trying to share the data that says like, hey, this is what it takes to have a healthy, solid life of well-being, to, to minimize depression. To, and, and again, it has nothing to do with God, and yet we ought to promote the data. Yeah, no, and 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 I I think a a Christian very much should come with that perspective that truth yeah. allows for us to to better live in harmony with one another and according to God's laws. Yep. Now, now, and, and would oh, you agree, let me let me ask you a question? Would yeah. you agree with this that if we go back in time to the way religion and we can use Christianity to formulate itself? So we have Judaism, we have the Old Testament, we've got all the laws and stuff given there. We've got early Christianity, and we've got Christ and and what He says. Wouldn't you agree that it is the further light and knowledge of the world progressing and becoming less tolerant of unhealthy behaviors that then caused the Christian church to let go of commandments that were deeply unhealthy around, say, slavery or rape or child abuse? Yeah. Uh, so I would say that—so that, that um, so I, I would frame it a little differently, though— so, um, first of all, the idea we're, we're talking as if there is such a thing as moral truth at all, like there, there is a right answer to any of these questions, right? Um, yeah. actually, would you real quickly pull up one of those slides I have? It was slide number 11. I had some slides I wanted to, to potentially go over here. And there's a, there's a great quote from CS Lewis and it goes back to this, this stuff that we were talking about. Um, yeah. and he says this, I'll just, I'll just read it for those who are listening. Please. Do you think that the morality of one people is ever better or worse than another? Progress means not just changing, but changing for the better. If no set of moral ideas were truer or better than any other, there would be no sense in preferring civilized morality to savage morality or Christian morality to Nazi morality. The moment that you say that one set of moral ideas can be better than another, you are in fact measuring them both by a standard saying that one of them conforms to that standard more nearly than the other. You are, in fact, comparing them both with some real morality, admitting that there is such a thing as real right, independent of what people think, and that some people's ideas get nearer to that real right than others. Now, Bill, I would say that you're saying that universal human flourishing is that standard by which moral truth is judged. Amen. Yes. Now, this is where I have a uh, have a question because wait, for, oh, go ahead, you, go ahead. Go ahead. You answer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah will you, you answer my question first, though? Yeah, will that's you, fine. Do you agree that the religious system you come from, which we trace its heritage back to Judaism and then into Christianity, mm -hmm. eventually there's a restoration, there's Mormonism. Do you again? I understand the idea that how do we know what's good? How do we know what's bad without God? I totally get that. I'm asking for your personal opinion of whether you think the world is a healthier, better place for flourishing and that you value flourishing and that much of that has come about, that the, the religion, the religious system and its heritage that you come from has adapted as the world has better recognized that we don't want to be in, uh, say, dictatorships or closed uh, loop systems, that we want to value an individual human and we want to allow belief differences we want there to be ways in which within a system that somebody can criticize the system itself do you agree that religion has had to let go of commandments that it portrayed as coming from god in and, and that that progress was to you progress yeah absolutely so i would say that okay. truth is what really matters i don't I don't care what's religious or not, but but let me let me just real quick answer it this way. This is the way I frame the whole issue. Yeah. The world historically did not have a belief in universal human dignity and value, okay? 
the 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 traditional world was the world of the jungle, the world where we essentially were tribes competing for dominance with one another. Totally. Right. Yeah. And it was Christianity historically, demonstrably, more than any other force that changed that over time slowly because of the ideas within the Judeo-Christian tradition. Now, what I will say though is that that doesn't happen overnight. The Christian world, like if I read the Old Testament, for instance, I'm reading the story of a people ensconced in an ancient culture with all of that barbarity and everything in there. And I believe fully that, that the aspects of that barbarian culture of that time come through in the text. That isn't surprising to me. What's surprising to me is that as I look at the Christian tradition over this time, that there seems to be running through it this spirit, this thread that is slowly transforming these people into seeing everyone as image bearers of God and as in, and having inherent dignity and worth. And I don't see how you get universal human dignity and worth from a collection of chemical processes that are playing themselves out over time. Yeah. So let me answer that. So um, I don't have a religious explanation for that at all. To me, it's there's a very secular, easy way to understand, which is, first off, you said something about how religion, Christianity, transformed barbarianism into something better. And I agree with you. But just because you use the canoe to get across the river doesn't mean you got to carry it on your back up the mountain. And, and what I mean by that is that when we go back in time, we human beings started off um, very self-centered. We and we still do when we're born as babies, right? We when we need our diaper change, we're hungry, we we cry, and we don't give uh, two licks what anybody else needs. The same is true if we go back far enough in our evolutionary process to what we were less than human. At some point, we were very self-centered. There came a moment where we became ethnocentric, uh, tribal, right? First, it was family, then it became the tribe. And uh, in a view of ethnocentricity, there was probably a moment in time where being tribal saved the human race. But just because being tribal saved the human race thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of years ago doesn't necessitate that tribalism is the best perspective to have in the modern moment. And so as so when you say like uh, religion or God using his uh, spirit, to work amongst God's children has slowly moved us in that direction. I would instead point to something like Ken Wilber's spiral dynamics and recognize that human beings in the evolutionary process and in the uh, advancement of cognitive development have gone from being self-centered to ethnocentric to uh, world-centric. And we can even progress to the point where we become universal centric. And the further we get along that, the more that we value every other species of life to the degree that we value our own. And so when we're self-centered, we only value ourselves. And then if we're family centric, we only value our family and us as part of it. And then we become ethnocentric and we value our tribe. But anything that's one layer beyond what we value, um, those are our enemies. And I would argue that there's a very secular explanation for how we move from being self-centered to being world-centric is what we're moving into right now. And, and there are other stages of development that have been laid out that we can move into. Um, I don't need a religious explanation to get there. Yeah, no. So here's my thought on that. In evolutionary terms, we are in a competition uh, for survival in a world of limited resources. Okay. And so I don't, again, rationally speaking, it would make mm -hmm. sense for me to maximize the benefits for me and my tribe in this competition for limited resources over that of others. But, but the thing is, is you're just changing the dynamics of where we draw the boundaries of the tribe, right? You could, you know, I don't mean, you don't have to do racial group. You could do family group. You could do, you could do all of humanity. You could do human beings as a species, right? And, and, and you then say, you know, it, it's arbitrary though, right? Like why is the morality of 
the Nazis who, who basically said, you know, the, the white Aryan race are the superior tribe in the world, like that group of yeah. people. And therefore that is, we should focus on acquiring resources and privileges for us and everyone else like screw them. They're not important because it's about us. Evolutionary, evolutionarily speaking, like there's a reason that when you breed horses, you don't breed the crappy horses. You you breed the best horses to get the best, most fit population. So I'm not understanding how biology is in is is in any way pointing us towards this universal human et you not only universal human ethic, but universal like all life matters ethic. I just I I guess I'm I'm just struggling to understand where that yeah. comes from. Just because you're breeding the uh, more athletic or the uh, stronger horses doesn't mean you have to take the the lesser horse out to pasture and shoot them. And when you, you, you look might at if there's folks, limited yeah. there, if there's limited resources, yeah. yeah. But but now we're to a point where again we should have a and we're going to get off into tangents. But maybe there's too many humans on this planet, and and maybe resources isn't the problem. But maybe it's multiply and replenish the earth is the issue. Mm -hmm. Maybe every ethnocentric tribe has done its best to uh, exponentially increase its numbers so that it could always uh, outdo another tribe in terms of violence. And when you value your tribe producing as much offspring as possible, what you end up with is a moment in time where the number of people on the planet outweigh especially if there's not drastic wars going on. And I think you and I both agree that war is not a, a great thing in terms of uh, human healthiness and well-being. Um, the fact that uh, we don't have wars going on and we've come from all this ethnocentricity to this moment means now we've got, what, 7 billion, 8 billion people on the planet and probably not enough resources for the long haul for the next 100, 200, 500 years. And so maybe we could just use less people. So what if, okay, so if you're in limited resources and you can only, uh, and I don't mean kill people, just, yeah, let's no. just stop promoting well, that well, everybody that was, have six kids. That was very much Margaret Sanger's, uh, thing. You know, that was what the yeah. eugenics movement was, was about. People think that that's mm -hmm. morally repugnant, but it was essentially to limit the reproduction of the least fit among us. And yeah. Certainly, biology teaches that there's different levels of fitnesses within a population. Do you think that there are human beings who are less fit than others? Um, yeah, I don't. I don't know that I would want to say that. Um, I, I think that how do you measure the worth of a person versus another human? How do you measure the worth of a person only well, for, because of their human. ability? Well, what, what, if we're going to say that morality, that the measure of morality is universal human thriving. Um, yeah. or, or, or let's say the thriving of the tribe to as many as we can, then, yeah, then yeah. you do have to look at the individual and say, your, your worth is how much you contribute to the society's goal. I mean, if you have someone who's a racist, sexist, misogynist pig, is he less valuable to you than a person who is working alongside you to promote the goals of equity and justice and equality? I mean, we'll yeah, kill people like that. Be, yeah. There has to be repercussions in a society for any human being whose uh, inclinations are to impose harm and trauma on others. So again, you in this world, we again, it's not a black and white world for me. In this world, we have sociopaths and narcissists and, and other sorts of unhealthy mental states that aren't any fault of their own. They were genetically born that way. Some people think every day about killing people, and most of us don't think at all about it. Um, but there has to be uh, boundaries in our society to prevent unhealthy people from hurting others. Now, but you, you getting say, into you, like the, please. Can, can I just ask this question about that? Because you talk mm. about things being healthy, right? Um, and the standard by which you're judging health or, you know, le, le, really what you're saying is that these people are, in a sense, immoral because unhealthy, immoral, it's kind of the same thing. They're not contributing to this goal of universal human flourishing, right? Um, and now, but like you said before, how do you measure the worth of someone? Would you grant that those kind of people that you can actually judge the worth of a person based on how much they contribute to a certain goal for humanity? 
Yeah, but now you're into the space or where we go. Some people are uh, have physical disabilities or mental disabilities and they can't contribute. And I'm going to promote a society, in my mind, what I would want to promote is a society that cares after the folks who aren't as able to contribute as those who are, uh, you know, have an IQ of 150 and uh, are bodybuilders. But isn't that, Um, isn't that similar to the, I mean, that's kind of like, and and again, I'm just, just so everyone knows, like, I don't, I'm trying to push the atheist sort of logic to where I'm trying to figure out where it goes. Because if you're, if you're saying that we are no different than horses and you want to breed the best horses, well, then the horses that have the disabilities and the problems and don't contribute to the betterment of the, of the horse herd, you need to eugenics makes sense. Eugenics is just a human form of yeah. biologically con- or, or controlled biological reproduction, or at least discouraging the reproduction of inferior um, inferior members of a, tr- of a of a herd. Yeah, you're what you're trying to do is pinpoint this idea that I'm subjectively choosing what is a good morality. And that only with God are we actually able to ensure that we have a morality that we know is good. But but that argument. Well, is I wouldn't re- real deep, quick just just to so we can steal man here because please my, please my argument if I were going to make the argument I would make this argument I would say please. that Bill you are if you grew up in Rome you'd have a totally different moral system if you grew up in mm-hmm. in ancient aztec society would your totally. moral view that you have is the product totally. of the modern culture that you're a part of and the modern totally. culture that you're a part of is the product of a judeo christian ethic which transformed yeah. western society's intellectual way that they view the world to where now everyone in western society believes in universal human dignity which is a total yeah. anomaly in history and scientifically makes no sense because biologically like inferior and superior is the name of the game in biological reproduction. Okay. Um, all right. So I don't, I don't disagree. Uh, so it seems as though what you're saying is that Christianity is the impetus that moved us into this space of valuing in the individual. So again, I'm, I'm super grateful for the tools of the past that were better than the tools we had previously. That has nothing to do with whether in this moment that's still the most effective tool to keep moving the needle. Well, that, and, 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 and I'll give an example, yeah, which is if we look at if we look at your the faith system you come from, it has been hit or miss drastically to the point where it has, as the world has changed and and been out at the forefront of it, your system has had to accommodate a progressing world that it didn't know to do the right thing until it saw the world doing the right thing and the world calling on it to change. And so if we go back to like the old Testament, the ideas around rape, for instance, again, um, when you say, Hey, Bill, how do you know that you're picking a morality that's better? Well, the same problem exists for Jacob which is that even though you come from a religious heritage and you believe in it, your moral code is still just as full of good and bad. And maybe because it's a closed loop system and people aren't allowed to criticize from within, maybe it's actually harder to get rid of bad behavior. And so I'm not suggesting that, hey, I've got it all figured out. What I think though, is that it's actually worse to think that you're in the true system and that God is leading your system and that your moral code is better than the outsiders and your moral code can't quite be questioned exactly. I think that's even worse than, than the nuance of what I'm saying, which is like, hey, I don't know that I've got this down perfectly, but the fact that I'm in an open loop system where people can criticize my points of view and they don't get thrown out, the chances are better that we're going to figure out how to treat each other better in that sort of system still with flaws. Mm-hmm. Much better than being inside a religious system where you're like, nope, God's here. We've got the moral code. We know right from wrong, but nobody can quite question it exactly. Otherwise, they suddenly become from an insider to an outsider. Yeah, no, and I, I think that uh, that on a, on a bigger level, I'm interested in the moral truth, right? Because I it, yeah, and I don't think there. I don't think that's real. I think once you discard God, the idea of 
objective exact truth is is a myth on its own would you um, would you and, say and, that and it's it, true that that but but would you agree that it's a moral truth that we should not you know do unnecessary harm to others like do you believe that it's a moral truth that you should not be a racist like is it true um, to say it's wrong to be a racist is that is that a true statement Absolutely. But only, but again, it's also subjective. I'm also deciding inside myself that that's true. And there are members of the KKK, for instance, who would completely disagree with that. And they have their own reasoning for that. Yeah, but you would you would certainly sure. say that they're wrong. Like not not that not sure. just that they, so, and you would. Not, yeah, I mean, sure. if, if I said that, you know, it's one thing for me to say I like Captain Crunch and you like Cheerios. It's another yeah. thing, you know, neither one of us are right. These are just statements of preference. When you're saying that being a racist is wrong, it doesn't matter if someone thinks that it's right. They are incorrect. They have they are they are contrary yeah. to the moral truth when they do that. And so if you say that there's no such thing as moral truth, then it, it leads me to the point where I go, well, on what grounds are you condemning the racist? Except for to say, I prefer X, you prefer Y. And again, it, it like moral language is meant to convey to someone that they're yeah. violating a, a standard that they're they're obligated to follow for some reason. Yeah. So you mentioned Yuval Harari and Sapiens. Again, there's a secular way to understand this idea that I think is much more rational. It's not as objective. It's not going to arrive at objective truth, but it's a much more rational way to understand how we got here. And so when you have a small tribe who is able to know each other based on intimacy, and then that tribe gets bigger and now it's 25 people to 150, and now they use gossip to collaborate and maintain human connection. Whereas primates, the chimps go and groom each other's hair, right? They pick mm -hmm. little bugs out and they spend time with each other every day, getting close to each other and showing each other on some level, like I like you and I'm willing to be your friend. I'm willing to collaborate. I'm willing to work with you. I'm willing to be in this tribe with you and for us to survive. But human beings invented language. And so there comes a point where over 150 people, I can't not only know everyone, even the people I know won't know everyone. Mm -hmm. And Yuval Harari uh, posits at that moment that human beings invented this idea of myth. And myth allows us to work together, allows us to be on a battlefield and I'm wearing the same uniform as you, so I know that we're the good guys and those are the bad guys. But one of the most powerful myths is religion. And it's powerful because what it does is it allows us to establish a moral code and put it into the voice of a third party who knows better than us. And it allows us then to go like, hey, I didn't make the rules, he did. And, and that allows whoever the authorities are to impose those rules, which benefit them for sure, to impose those rules and us not to have any way to push back against it because that's God. And what I'm saying is if we just throw that out, and go like this is not black and white. This is much more messy than that. It kind of seems we like it's, a, it's gonna... a power play by those in power, mm -hmm. right? They they create uh, a myth. It has that, always been a that, power play by yeah. those in power. Okay, so so those yeah. those in power create a myth that then perpetuates their particular view and gets everybody on board. My question, I guess, would be, but are you admitting that your own morality is a myth, but it just isn't based in? in power my morality is completely subjective and it is based in the idea that every human being should be treated as having value and should be allowed to have as much flexibility and space to flourish so and with the caveat that boundaries should always be in place to prevent unhealthy people and unhealthy actions from imposing harm or trauma on other people. And if and that is entirely subjective. So but I think so the but, collective one more moment. Oh, go ahead. I think that the collective humanity agrees with that. And I think that we've always agreed with that collectively. When we parse out like, oh shoot, this tribe of 50 is coming up against us and we better build fortifications and put up walls. Um, when we're allowed without our own fear of survival. I think we all, most of us, and when I say all, I mean most of us, we all sense like, hey, we should be kind to each other. And the reason we do that 
is because over millions of years, it has benefited our species in terms of survival to collaborate, to have reciprocity, to create fairness, to the extent of if folks would go on to YouTube right now and they would click on uh, animal morality, there's four or five videos mostly by the same guy. There have been tons of experiments done among primates who have no idea of Heavenly Father out in the universe giving them a morality. And yet these animals, elephants, uh, chimps, different uh, animals among the, the, the monkeys or primates besides us, where they will work together to benefit the one who's hungry. Well, they'll, well, they'll work together to ensure that they treat each other with fairness. Morality doesn't require God. And we all look at two monkeys working together to ensure that well, the one has food when he's hungry well, could I... as being like, oh, look at that. That's that's a healthy way to treat each other. And I don't need God to know that that's a healthy way. But but I think the re what you frame as healthy is totally conditioned by your social your socialization. Like it a is, Roman, it is totally a, conditioned by evolution and the human species need to survive. And in order to survive, to be fair to each other, to have reciprocity and to collaborate. Absolutely. So, so real quick, can you go to slide 13 real quick? I actually want to, I want to check something out here. So Nietzsche, uh, guy on the left, the great mustache, <laughs> um, he has a, a, a work about the genealogy of morals. Um, where he talks about what he calls master morality and slave morality. So you very clearly, Bill, I, I, he would argue, and, and I would argue as well, if we look at, you're right, most people today in our modern society are on your, have the same kind of point of view as you do. But if we were to take the clock back, and go back 10,000 years mm -hmm. and take all of those human beings, you'd be in a very, very slim minority. And, oh, absolutely. And, totally. And so did we evolutionarily change just in the past few, you know, I would say 100 years when we've really pushed this universal human morality ethic? Because yeah. what, what Nietzsche's point was, is that if you go back to what, what he does, he asked the question, when we say good, what do we think of? You think of kindness and empathy and taking care of others. Where he went, if you go back to traditional societies like the Greeks and the Romans, they would, and, and you could even do Aztecs, Mongols, when you said the good, they thought of things like strength, you know, conquest, domination, you know, power like that yeah. was their thing and what what his point was was that it was and he blamed it on the the, the worst of all the jews because he was you know a german in that kind of era had some anti-semitism was that jesus came as this kind of like to the losers and said hey guys actually to be good is to be meek and compassionate and kind and he what he points out is that we as we as human beings we get to decide what is right and what is wrong. And to some extent, I'm going, holy cow, if I have white male privilege and power, what in the heck is there in science that tells me that I should give up the power and privilege that allows for me to, to propagate myself more into the universe and my tribe if this is ultimately a, a competition for survival where we want the fittest to survive. And you can see how Nietzsche influenced the Nazis. And you're sitting there saying that's abhorrent, that's totally wrong. And my thought is, is I agree with you, Bill, but I think that the reason you think that is because you are socialized in a Western culture that's been ensconced in a Christian ethic for super long. Yeah, and that may be partially true, but that's not the full fact of it. So your question is, why did morality change? And I think the simple reason is for most of us in the modern world, we don't live in a moment where we have to really put our lives on the line to survive every day. And so when you look at any other time period, or you can even go to some countries in the, in the world today, and where your life is on the line, whether it's a matter of not being able to find food, whether it's a matter of there's an amount of violence in your geographic location that you have no choice if you want to survive but to fight against the other people. And any time that you live a life in fear 
of having resources for the next day, you are going to determine your moral code very differently than the folks who have the privilege of being able to have their needs. I got a roof over my head. I got food in the refrigerator. Um, I don't feel any pressure today that something in my life is going to fall apart if I don't if I don't get up at six in the morning and bust my ass until uh, eight o'clock tonight. So, um, when I, so it is privilege, but the privilege of feeling safe and secure allows me not to have my ego passing judgment on other human beings and determining that I need to get ahead of them. Rather, it gives me the privilege of going, hey, wait a minute. Why couldn't we create a world where everybody feels safe and everybody's valued and there is an insider or outsiders? And um, I, it might be privilege that allows that. And, and Russia could push a button today that would change that entire dynamic and we might go backwards. But so long as I'm here, I'm going to use it to promote progress. And to me, progress in the modern moment is to create flourishing lives. And again, you're right. It's subjective. If I was living in uh, an apocalyptic world where things fell apart, I'm going to determine that the only decisions I can make in this moment is to figure out how I'm going to survive today. And I might have to take things from others to give to my own. The moral code completely changes because mm -hmm. it's subjective. I, um, I don't, I don't have an issue with recognizing that if there was a God and he could deliver his moral code perfectly through human beings, we would all be better off. I just don't believe that's even, I, I believe that's absurd. And, and let me, and let me just say here, we we're about an hour in mm -hmm. and you've been leading a chunk of the discussion. Yeah. Do you mind if I yeah, yeah, no, we, sort we, of we we can absolutely I'd do like, that. Real, real quick, just just to just please. to kind of sum this up a little bit. So so you believe that morality is totally subjective, uh, that it is socially yeah. contingent, um, and that the the um that our abundance allows us to begin to to begin to take into consideration other people. Um and I'm trying to think how else to sum this up. And that, but that ultimately you're not necessarily saying that you're, that, that there is a standard by which we can judge any moral system to be better or worse than any other, because it all ultimately is, is contingent upon, um, upon the conditions of, of those people. Is that, is that a fair summation? Uh, for the most part, if I lived in an age, let's say the age of the Vikings, if I lived in an age where my small town is threatened by some other group, my morality is going to be based completely differently. So yes, I would agree it is essentially entirely subjective, but that when we live in moments where we have more privilege and we feel safer in our lives, we ought to move the needle towards protecting people and helping people uh, giving everybody the ability to feel safe and secure and valued in their world. Yeah. Okay. So, so then in those, and so in those, those older contexts, racism, for instance, wouldn't necessarily have been wrong in a Viking society because it was a, it was a tighter competition for resources. And so if you want to, you had to protect your racial group, that would be morally understandable. Uh, racism is always wrong. And yet in some moments you have no choice, but to other people because your very survival depends. They're either killing you or you're killing them. See the moment you take ego out of it, the moment you take the fear of another human being hurting you. Now you have the privilege to be able to be kind. And unfortunately we have moments in this world where racism or othering somebody else was the only way to prevent them from slaughtering you. Um, people are going to do what they're going to do. And in moments where fear is the prevailing motivation on human beings, they're going to make very different choices than they would at times where they don't have the fear of making it for another day. And so again, racism is always wrong. It's, and but there that, are moments but, in but time that, where people that are going to do things that differently. Wouldn't be, and that's not subjective. Like it's wrong regardless of what someone thinks. 
Um, Cause that's, that's where I'm, I, I guess it, that's where I'm struggling is I'm just both. struggling to yeah, understand know. like where you'll say it's subjective yeah. and then you'll say that some things are absolutely wrong. And, but that's because that's because you're not open to the idea that there is no God and everything is chaos and we ought to do the best we can. And so we're all going to ascribe to an ideal. Racism is always wrong. In the meantime, also recognizing that there is no God and it's all chaos and everything is myth. So yes, I'm in, I'm inventing a ideal that others also agree with. And it is subjective entirely. And I also think it's true. And, yeah. and so you see me as contradicting myself and I see me as doing the best I can with a chaotic world that started 13.7 billion years ago. And here we are in this moment as human beings and trying to do the best we can with what we have. Got it. No, fair enough. So yeah. I'll, I'll let you kind of, kind of steer things a little bit here. Sorry if I've kind of, you know, no, no, you're perfectly good. I love it. Um, so I want to get at this idea and I'll, I'll just tell you where I'm, where I want to walk you into, because I, I really think this has to be addressed. And it's the idea that the folks on your side of this issue who say like, man, the only way we can have an objective morality is through God and God as the perfect, all knowing, all powerful, all present being. He's the only person who has the ability to give us a good moral code and to know that it's good. And I agree with you, by the way, except I just don't believe there is a God. But I, I'm guessing that, again, um, I'm hoping you'll, you'll deal with this. I'm guessing that you would recognize that even if that's true, even if there is a God, and even if we could know for sure that he's not tricking us and that he really is all good, that he's not just... Uh, really a bad guy, but portrays himself as good, right? That if he really is good, that no religious system has done an adequate job of being able to take that goodness and put it into a code in such that we can all be rest assured they've got this thing down pat and it treats people the right way. In other words, God of the Old Testament has lots of horrible rules. God of the New Testament really isn't much better. Uh, spare the rod, spoil the child, which is an advocacy for child abuse coming from Proverbs and Psalms. The idea that uh, somebody should marry their rapist, the idea that genocide is God approved, the idea that um, grown adults who are strangers to children can go into rooms privately and sit with a child one-on-one -on -one and ask them questions of a sexual nature. It seems as though all religious systems are just as much hit or miss as the collective atheist or people who don't impose God as part of, this, of the issue seem to be doing no better and maybe even worse than the folks who don't use God to uh, formulate morality. Do you agree that religion, even with God, doesn't seem to do much better than the rest of the world and maybe even does worse? So first I'll say just the, the term religion is really broad. I generally like to be more specific because I don't believe in quote unquote religion. I believe in Christianity and specifically the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Do you think do you yeah. think Mormonism? Let me ask it this way. Do you yeah. think Mormonism does a better job than the world? And let's just use the United States because that's where Mormonism essentially is. Mm -hmm. Again, I know it's a world religion, but most members yeah. are concentrated here. Do you think Mormonism does a better job than the world at morality? Yes. Um 100%. Okay. Okay. Do you think Mormonism gets things wrong that the world got right either ahead of it or are getting right right now that Mormonism is getting wrong? I think that um, Mormonism, the principles of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which go beyond Mormonism, okay, they 
are the they are the engine that has driven what you call social pro progress in the world for the, at least the past 2000 years if not more okay and and i would say that um the church of jesus christ of latter day saints is an imperfect organization that is continuing that tradition under the authority of priesthood leadership who are guided by God towards doing that. Do they always get it right? No. But do I believe that the principles of the gospel are what they teach that what they teach human beings is how to properly harmonize not just for the 80 years that we're here on earth, but for the eternity that exists afterwards. Okay. okay but we can't prove eternity exists afterwards. So we have to stick with just here. Um, well, because otherwise we you're, can, you're, 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 you're asking for something to be part of the conversation that, that I couldn't agree to. You're right. But um, you can't, I, there's no proof either way, right? We don't know if, if there's an afterlife or not. We yeah. live as though we, we posit the idea that there is an afterlife and that there are particular things about that afterlife. And that gets factored into the equation you, as to how we should do live. Do you think Mormonism did a better than the rest of the United States job at treating people of color as human beings. Did it, did it? No, did it, it, the, the, no. the okay. theology, the theology that we had on race and the priesthood was, was wrong. It was abhorrent. Do you think that we uh, do an adequate job of treating LGBT people as human beings in the LDS church? Compared I, to the rest I of guess, the country. I guess you're going to have to answer the question of what does it mean to treat them like a human being, okay? To because, allow them to have all the same rights and privileges without punishment that the world gives somebody when they're not hurting someone else. So the you have to understand, you have to reframe the entire way that this is viewed just to understand each other. Do you think we other. treat women? Do you think we treat real, real women? Quick, real quick, let me, let me answer that well. question. Let me, let me answer the yeah. question here, okay? So first of yeah. all, the a LGBT person, a gay person, has every ability to do everything that a Latter Day Saint can do, except for the fact that if they want to engage in homosexual behavior, that's unauthorized according to the laws of God, because we do not believe that that will lead to their ultimate well-being, because ultimate well-being is found in an eternal marriage. Now you will you will disagree with the concept that an eternal marriage even exists, that there's an afterlife and all of that. So none of this makes any sense to you. But if no, we were, to, it, if, if we were to posit the fact yeah. that a person could not reach their highest potential in an afterlife without entering into a heterosexual union, yeah. then it would be understandable that we would encourage people to, sure. th that's the path that you have to take to reach your highest potential. Does Mormonism have a good track record at figuring those kinds of things out? In other words, it got the race issue so wrong and, and essentially had to apologize, although it won't, to the extent where I, I, I don't have any rational reason to trust Mormonism to, when it lays out its rules and codes and policies and procedures and doctrines, to really know what is best. So, for instance... Not only did it get the race issue completely wrong and had to reverse it, it, it has had to disavow its previous knowledge and doctrine that people of color were less valiant or cursed. It, um, so, it so, used to hold, hold okay. on. It used to say that folks who were gay, if they if people masturbated, they became gay, or that gay was a choice. These are prophet seers and revelators who seem unable over. 15 men at any given moment over generations of 15 men. So we're talking hundreds of prophets, seers, and revelators who seemed unable to discern the reality of race, who seemed unable to discern where homosexuality came from, and they don't have a track record by which I would gauge their morality as better than mine to the point where they have come closer to me as time has gone on, See, then I came now, to them. <laughs> so this is this is where we have to almost take a step back. You're positing that there is such a thing as a morality that's better than some other morality, right? The only reason that Mormonism you can... says so. Mormonism, as it progresses, is admitting that its past views were abhorrent. So it's agreeing with. Yeah, me. but but 
that's that's sort of the thing. That but that's so you're, to posit, so you're saying that but Mormon, that's to posit so, that's to posit yeah. an objective standard by which we can judge. So you're that saying Mormonism right is wrong, wrong to a if yeah, you, so if you're you saying abandon Mormonism. that, remember this. Yeah. The world was why did racism exist in the first place? Why has racism been the human universal forever? Yeah. It has been it is not the, the reason racism was first of all, slavery and things like that were taken away and racism was gotten rid of was because of Christianity itself. What you don't realize is, is that you're judging Mormonism by the standards of a Christian worldview. And fine. Mormonism's judging more. Hold on. Mormonism's judging Mormonism. Mormonism is so you either have to, what you're saying right now, what I again I, I don't know that I'm I want to make sure I um suggest your position accurately. Uh -huh. It sounds to me like what you're saying is morality, you know, again, sort of subjective, right? What's what's good, what's bad. Mormonism is telling us that its past views on these issues were wrong. It's telling us that its past views it, it on homosexuality us through Christian through the Judeo-Christian tradition, it provided us with the very concept that racism is wrong. Remember, I don't yeah. look at my tradition as as mm -hmm. as being the end all. I look at it as where part does of something religion, bigger. Where does Christianity where does Christianity tell you that slavery or racism it like it's hit or miss? There are some scriptures that say we're all equal and you know, all alike unto God. And there are other scriptures that tell the slave to be kind to his master, even if his master's harsh. Like that's a mixed bag. And so if, it, it, it just it, like it the rest of the from, world, but, it's a but, mixed bag. But if you can look at the actual historical outgrowth, it came, slavery, for instance, specifically, uh, the beginning of the real abolitionist movement began with the Quakers. Okay. And it, be, and it spread throughout Christendom and the reason it spread throughout Christendom was because they had ideas within Christianity like that were all created in the image of God. Or you have Paul who says there is no you know, bond or free, male nor female, uh, slave or free. A and so these sorts of ideas were within the Christian thought world, and they resonated with what I believe to be the spirit of God inside of them. And this greater moral truth and light came about. Right. And that, that, that seems and, like and was, but the thing yeah. is, is there's always a residual culture that it's fighting against. Remember, yeah. you can't be angry because it takes a while for people to start to figure these things out and to, and to actually align with the moral truth. And yes, if and I wouldn't say the church was so far behind everybody else, there was at all times in the church. The problem was that there was an unhealthy uh, respect for tradition within the church that they didn't question Brigham Young's assumptions. Now we have, and we've rejected those. And therefore we understand that certain positions that the church had towards race are, are, are you know, they were wrong. But again, you have to have a standard by which to judge that something is wrong at all. The problem is, is that on your worldview, Bill, it's all just arbitrary nonsense. It's all just myth. So Racism isn't actually wrong on an atheist worldview. It just happens to be the social convention of the era that you live in. Yeah, and I agree and disagree. So you seem so the idea that you know Mormonism has been led by prophets, seers, and revelators, and they claim they talk directly to God to the extent where they really do suggest that they are the source. Elder Oak said, uh, if, if a revelation disagrees with us, then it's the wrong revelation. So these men put themselves as being in earshot of God. I'm wondering what God's limitations are that he can't just tell uh, David O. McKay that, you know what, the world's right. Why couldn't he have told George Albert Smith? Why couldn't he have told Brigham Young? It seems like what you're saying is that these guys are clouded by the thoughts of their day, and hence God doesn't really have the ability to give them clarity because they're so stubborn that they'll just hang well, on and, to their and faulty I would, opinion. And I would say, and this is a, a very argument I use against a lot of like Calvinists, for instance, and people who have uh, a, a deterministic view of the world. Um, the thing is, is that God has to work with us, and we are that flawed persons. Like and and that no, 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 so no, real distant, quick, though. you, you, I, I'm a believer that I'm as entitled to receive revelation from God for my family. Yeah. And in the same way as the prophet of the church. Okay. I believe that. 
I don't believe that God has that 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 he has some special like red telephone to Jesus up in the celestial room of the of the church. Yeah. I believe revelation runs uh through all of us just the same. And I am I can be clouded in my judgment and get things wrong, and so can they. What's more shocking isn't that they sometimes get things wrong. What's amazing is how much they get right when it comes to I, the I fundamentals. I don't think they get that much right. Yeah, well, I don't think they get that. But much but the right. thing is, is that's because you only look at the things that are wrong. You don't look at the. And maybe outcomes. you only look at the things that are right. But I don't. No, no. I look. If at I were the, to list, if I were to look at the at, at the objective outcomes of the church yeah. for the people who live the faith, their lives come out better again and again when you. Is that live true for Jehovah's gospel. Witnesses? Is that true for to you the can degree, make that argument? To the degree that they align with moral truth, that's true. The question is this: mm. your life gets better when you align with moral truth. What I'm saying, Bill, is that I don't even think that you you don't even have a ground for saying moral truth exists at all. It's all yeah. just subjective. And preference. yet, somehow, in my own inner gut has allowed me to be ahead of the church over the last 20 years. Yeah. It, that's strange, isn't it? That you have prophets, seers, and revelators who have an inside track to God. You can say you have the same revelation they do. But again, it's a closed system. They don't let you raise your voice and go, you guys might be wrong here. They don't really let you do that. And so it's a closed system of leaders who you say don't really have any more access to revelation than you do. And I'm going to posit that I do because my intuition has been more right on people of color, has been more right on women, has been more right on LGBT. But how do you? Folks. But but remember, of course it's right if it's all subjective. Your standard for what is your right church, is your, you. No 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 no. <laughs> I agree with you if the church doesn't change position, Jacob. But the church has changed its position and now disavows its past positions. And I held those positions before the church did. Like, in other words, I came around. In other words, I used to agree with the church because the church taught me to, to agree with it, uh -huh. that homosexuality was a choice. Before the church chose to move and go, you know what, guys? We don't think it's a choice anymore. I already in my gut knew that. When the church, when, when the church was still teaching me that, yes, we give blacks the priesthood, but they were still cursed and less valiant prior to 78. I had already shifted and changed because my intuition told me that that was the correct view. In other words, but I again, get to be further again, ahead again, when I ignore prophets, seers, and revelators you're getting, than, when if I, than when I take their <laughs> advice and I stick to it. But the thing is, is that, again, this conversation, if it's about morality, you do realize that you're pointing to saying that you were aligned with a moral standard that that is the right one earlier than the church was. And the church agrees with me. So do you disagree with the church? On what specifically? I came to a viewpoint that you and I both agree is entirely subjective. Because I don't believe in God and I don't believe in a moral code coming from God. So I'm just creating my own morality. You're, you're, you're probably aligning with the culture that you're being socialized into is what you're doing. Mm, so in other words... Mormonism being a closed loop system still is going to be behind the world and the people in it that are updated by uh, Let, modern progress. I, what I would th there is no there is no progress in your worldview. All there is is change. You have you have a so 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 to to real quickly. That's not my view. But but you've posited that there is no actual objective moral standard. So how can you say that something and, is progressing yeah. towards a, towards something? without a moral standard for it. Mm, I, I, I said both. I said that, for instance, racism being racism being bad is subjective and it's true. And because I live in a world where God doesn't exist and everything is chaos and myth, I'm going to hold that view. Yeah. And that's just the social convention of your time. And people in the past of the vast Which, majority of humans didn't hold that view. My, my the social I guess, conventions, hold, here, hold on, the social conventions of my time tend to still come to the right decision before the church does. Bill, you have to step back and say there is no right decision. But the church says there is. The you, church disavows I, its racist th theories that's of the fine. past. And that's fine. They can do you do disagree that. with the church? What, no, I, I, I agree with what the church is saying, that the church had things wrong when it came to its views on the past, and there were bad theories about it. Let me, so let you're me trying use... to play it both ways. Hold on a minute. You're 
you're you're trying to play it both ways. So you're trying to hold an argument that um, what you know the church changed. It's not how do we know what's good or bad? It just it's just the church acknowledges that its views on homosexuality and race were wrong. And I'm telling you, I came to those views before the church. Okay. And you seem to be sidestepping that. No, no, no. Let's, let's do this. Let's do this. How did Bill, I, and you're saying this you is got, you got time. to that, you got to that based on the social conventions of, of your time. Why you, is the church behind the social conventions of the time when the social conventions of the time are correct based on the church's own admittance that it had to disavow the things of the past? I believe that there are, there have been times when, when the social conventions of the time have been ahead of the church, but I think that those are rare, rare exceptions to the rule. Okay. I think. Okay. For the, give me, for the, give me. Look Give at me 10 times the church was ahead of the world in a way that I could go, man, that looks prophetic rather than because you're going to tell me something like two hour church and family home evening. I, no, I don't, no, I would, say, I would say, I would say, I would say first, I would start with the Old Testament with the idea that all human beings are created in the image of God, male and female. That is a radical change from the, the, the ancient world and culture. Okay. The idea that slaves did merit dignity and respect of some kind and were not purely the property of their masters. That in the New Testament was totally foreign to, to the world. The idea that those who are the least among us, the losers, as it were, actually matter just as much as the king, that was an innovation of, of, of Christianity and, and what I believe to be the moral truth propagated by the prophets of God throughout scripture. In the restoration, the centrality of the male-female dynamic and the notion that our highest good is found through the integration of the masculine and feminine into one, that sort of a concept and idea, revolutionary for its time, okay? Um, I would say that in uh, uh, the, the giving of women rights in 1800s Utah, Utah was ahead of the curve in the United States at that. Time. That was so that they could have more voting power. Absolutely, and and yeah, and so also there's a secular explanation yeah, for that. But that there's also Brigham. Profit. Well, then why was Brigham Young out there sending his daughters off to uh to to medical schools? You have um the it wasn't just about voting. Believe me, Latter Day Saint women were were encouraged to to be very active and not just be barefoot and pregnant the whole time that's a myth so so okay, real quick dude, but but my whole yeah. point is this this discussion ultimately we can debate you know the churches you know are the are the leaders reliable that's outside sort of the frame of this particular discussion about morality because it, my point it, it is isn't that, though Here, here's why it isn't though. My, my point because is you can't hold them accountable yeah. to any sort of a standard if no standard exists if it's just your arbitrary preferences you're just saying they like cheerios i like captain crunch they they're bad because they have a different set of moral values but i, I disagree so I disagree. Here's and here's why. Um, I'm going to let's agree with you. Uh -huh. There is a God. He is good, and He would like to give us the perfect moral code. What I'm telling you is that no religious system, and especially Mormonism, shows any ability to give us that code in any way that I should trust it over my own intuition. I would say that your intuition has been given to you by your social conventions and that the Christian tradition built the entire civilization that you're a part of and gave you primarily the values that you most cherish and the prosperity yeah. that you experience because mm -hmm. of the revolution of Christianity throughout history. And I think that's demonstrable. And I'll, I'll agree with that. And I'll add to it that Mormonism is still behind that. And it, and it demonstrates it's behind it by the fact that it changes positions after the world does and then admits that it was wrong and that's why it had to change if positions. If you believe that there is a Christian tradition that is more inspired than Mormonism and that aligns better and propagates moral truth more fully than Mormonism, I would love to hear about it. I don't believe that Mormonism um, is perfect, but I believe that, yeah. a, that I believe, first of I, I say this, I'm a theist. I believe that there is a God. I am a Christian first. And the reason I have chosen to be a Latter-day Saint is because of all of the Christian traditions, it seems to be the one that it has the best case for what God is doing today. 
That is my yeah, particular, I, that's my particular way of viewing it. And so if yeah. you were to say Mormonism is bad, and let's say you do, let's say that, that you convince me Joseph Smith was a liar and, a, and all that kind of stuff. I wouldn't then go well, and- Well, at least on lots of that. cases he was. Well, I mean, if we're, if, hold on. You just said, if I could convince you that Joseph Smith was a liar, it is demonstrable on numerous occasions that he was. That, and I'm not here to argue that. What I'm here to okay. say, what I'm here to make the case of is that if you were to convince me of that, I would still be a Christian. Why? Because Aren't you already the convinced Christian of that? Tradition Hold on a minute. Posits, State your personal view. What was that? Is Joseph Smith on multiple occasions a liar? I believe that Joseph Smith, just like any one of us is human being and probably did tell lies. Why, why do you never say yes or no? Well, because I want to caveat the answer so that people I have know. agreed with you at numerous points in this conversation. <laughs> All right. And you distance yourself. Whenever I ask you a question that pins you down, you avoid it. So is Joseph Smith on multiple occasions a liar? Just like I am. Yes. We all okay, tell lies sometimes. Yeah. No, no. Me too. So, so here's, here's what I'm going to say though. Okay. Going back to the point and the essence of the discussion to the very beginning, it's the idea here that you are launching a moral critique of the church, but that your moral critique of the church is ultimately just, it, there is no moral standard by which you think things can be judged anyway. So it seems other to be than incoherent. the church admits that I'm right after it changes its ways. So you adopt the church's standards? No, no, the church adopts mine. Then, so you're saying that the, the church is adopting the socially constructed fashions of the day yeah as elder holland says the world goes here and then i go here and the world goes <laughs> here and I go all here. right i i would encourage everyone to watch the full thing he's he was very clearly saying that that's but the is, problem but, is that the regardless world, isn't, that, isn't that chase true, the world, that's a problem as the world as world and science have dictated that homosexuality is not a choice the church has moved to that nobody received yeah a revelation i'm, I'm glad the that the church i'm the church glad that, i'm glad when that's the not church, the point i'm making hold on hold on i know you're glad i'm i'm when I don't care what the church says. I care what's true, Bill. That's what I care about. Okay. And so if it's true, then I want it. My thing okay. is this, is that when I look at the whole of human history, what I find is that moral truth, which you don't believe exists, that moral truth has been propagated more than anywhere else by the mm. Judeo-Christian tradition. Yeah, but that you're using that to suggest that all the rest of the thoughts fall in line and are true. No, so I've I never said that. With, I, that that um, would be a straw man of my argument. I'm saying that okay. that if you have a better engine for producing moral truth outside yeah. of the Judeo-Christian tradition, I would be shocked to find out what that was because demonstrably in history, moral progress has been driven by the ethics of the Judeo-Christian tradition as they've yeah, taken root in society. So I a hundred percent agree with you that the Judeo-Christian uh, framing has uh, been deeply influential in uh, us moving into modern society. And that is good. You're, you're positing it as if that's mostly good or all good. And I'm just going to say, like, it's hit or miss. And um, uh, let me think here for a moment. So I, I would say that it was it was coming out of that. <laughs> Remember, you had an, an existing culture of barbarianism that is the human default. And Christianity, uh, but, that, but that's in one part of the world. There, there were there were tribes of Native Americans, for instance, who had developed really kind ways to treat each other and to take care of the planet. You're picking a specific spot in the world, and you're saying this, and Aztecs, it may even hold true for Mayans, a large part of the world. Any any yeah, major empire, but it's hit that, or miss. But no, any major empire that got any traction at all didn't do it on being nice to people. It did it on conquering and having a strong belief system that it went and imposed on everybody else and basically took over the power. If anything, the, the lesson of history is if you want to be great and successful, you need to have the power and you yeah, need to beat everybody over the head and take it and, and, right. and win. it was. But what's yeah. weird is that that is the norm 
But somehow Christianity came to dominate the world with a totally different message. And while we have Nietzsche here on the screen, that was Nietzsche's point. He said Christianity is what will destroy us because Christianity makes us weak because it values the yeah. losers. And frankly, if you look at history, he's right. The great paradox of Christianity, and the reason I believe it's something inspired, is because it showed the great power in love, and yeah. that love is actually the greatest power in the world. Yeah. So while I agree with you that the Judeo-Christian framing deeply contributed to us moving into the modern moment where folks do feel safer, uh, it may have been a alternative choice to what was going on throughout much of the rest of the world. You're you're also saying that that's how I choose all of my beliefs, and that's not true. So when I listen to, for instance, Sam Harris's TED Talk, he points to the direct idea that we can use science to dictate morality. Mm -hmm. If the science shows that doing certain things or treating each other in certain ways ends up with us flourishing better as a human species or us taking ca better care of the planet or us caring for other species of life on it, then that science is a credible way at which to arrive at creating a moral code. And because closed loop systems like Mormonism are behind on is social, social issues of how to treat other people, at least often, if not most of the time, then it is certainly reasonable for the two of us to suggest that rather than leaving it to a closed loop system where prophets tend to get really serious things wrong and tend to barely have the degree of communication that I guess the rest of us have with God, then it certainly is reasonable and rational for us to put science on a pedestal over a real, any given religious system, and maybe even especially yours. Well, the thing is, is I would say that you need to look at what science actually says, okay? Because science says that everything is cause and effect, right? Your, your, um, like you don't believe that human beings have free will, correct? Free will? No, I don't. So we don't have agency. So we don't actually. I don't believe. Yeah. I don't, I, if it is, if there is free will and science agrees, by the way, all, almost all the prevailing scientists agree that even if there is a degree of free will, it is extremely limited. Okay. So real quick, would you go to slide number nine on that, that slideshow? I want to, I want to get your thoughts on this because it plays into this whole thing, right? And the first premise that I want to have here is that people are only morally responsible for the choices that they make, right? If you don't make a choice, like it's not, you're not responsible for it because you didn't make the choice, but now let's get rid of agency altogether. Yeah. So we don't make choices. In other words, yeah. you don't even make the choice that you like the person who is racist didn't choose that, right? Somebody right. who's like, totally. if you were born in their circumstances or in their, you know, whatever, you'd be racist, right? Yeah. If I was born into a family where I had the predisposition to be a serial killer and my dad was absent from the home and my mom abused me, I might turn into a serial killer with no choice of my own. So how can we have a coherent discussion about moral responsibility if yeah. you're not morally responsible for any of your choices because you ultimately don't make choices. So I had an interview with a geneticist about five years ago or so, and we were talking about the LGBT issue. And I got done with the interview and I said, hey, I'm not sure I'm going to include this in the conversation or not, but I want to talk to you about it. I said, apologists are often throwing out this slippery slope that if we, if we allow men to marry men and have sex and women to marry women and have sex, that we're going to eventually as a society create a slippery slope where uh, child predators get to have sex with children and people who uh, have an inclinations towards bestiality get to have sex with animals, for instance. And I said, I don't want to, I don't want to promote these kinds of arguments because I think it's a horrible argument in terms of rationale because consent is a big deal. And again, subjective, right? But how Consent's can a person, a how can a person hold, hold consent on, if they don't on. have choice? Let me, Sorry. I know, let me, Sorry. I, know, I know, totally. We use terms, <laughs> you're right. We use terms in ways that doesn't actually reflect 
what's really going on, but it's the best we have in the language that we use. We all act as though we have agency, even if some of us understand that that agency is extremely limited or non-existent. So when I talked to this geneticist, I said, I want to ask you about uh, serial killers and child predators. And she goes, Bill, you don't want to include this in the conversation because as a geneticist, it is demonstrable that it is genetic or epigenetic. Genetic meaning that it's passed from, you know, semen and egg. Mm -hmm. Epigenetic meaning something else is going on in the womb, at least, that contributes to chemical reactions that now has that person having this predisposition. Mm -hmm. She said child predators aren't choosing to do that. They are predisposed genetically to doing such. Now, we can go like, man, I wish there was a God, and I wish that things were choices, and I wish there was agency. But if there is an agency... There just is an agency and we have to deal with that. And again, the science says at best, your agency is nothing like what Mormonism taught you. By the way, it also changed on that. We used to have free agency. You're old enough, I think, to have grown up in a Mormonism, because I certainly did, where we had free agency. And now we have moral agency, which is defined very different. So, and so I'm saying once again, Mormonism shows that it thinks it has a right to determine what's right and wrong, but it seems unable to discern such. See, but I, I'm, and, I'm, I'm yeah. going further and almost deconstructing all of this now. So I'm going, Please. okay, so, so, the, so a person doesn't choose to be sexually attracted to children. Can they choose whether or not to actually have sex with children? Um, yes, and no. So, um, I mean, but, but it's not yes or no. It's, it's either it, yes or it, no. No, but it, how, it is yes or no. How can because you, some you either, people, you either can make a choice to, to, to do something mm, or you can't. And you were, you were, you were determined by it. You, you are determined by it. And yet, in being determined, that some people will, in their determined actions, not they they will in their mind think they're choosing again the, the issue is that in your head you think you're making a choice but at least some science suggests that subconsciously there's a decision being made 300 milliseconds before your I'm, conscious brain makes the decision so how are, so, why would we so hold them why hope? would we take that person and say that they're because bad. they're causing harm because they're causing unintentional because they're causing I, I know, intentional they harm they, they didn't they, they they how can you can't intentionally it, it cause anything if yeah. you're if you're if it's just your you're a chemical reaction playing yourself out over time yeah. and the chemicals in your brain caused you to have these feelings it caused you to engage in this behavior he's not i mean this person isn't morally responsible they're just dancing to the to their genetics like you were talking about yeah, but you want you want to okay. So you want to play this both ways because in part you want to disagree. You want to say we have agency. Yeah, absolutely. I I disagree with premise two hundred percent. You you disagree. You, agree with it, you disagree with the prevailing scientists of today who say that that say that free will is at best extremely limited. I am a believer that we have the ability to choose our response to whatever stimuli that, that happened to us. I believe that we have agency. I believe that we are influenced by things, but we choose our response to the influences that hit us. Yeah. Um, so that would go against the prevailing science of today. Yeah. And I'm simply going to side. Well, with I would say, no, it goes against the, the uh, a purely materialistic scientific worldview, which I agree. If you are a pure materialist, Scientists, like, of course, Which is the majority no of the majority of scientists who have any expertise on this issue. Yeah, the, the majority posit. of the majority of scientists hold to a materialistic worldview, which is not surprising because science is something that is done utilizing a materialistic, you know, it's 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 operating with material only. I don't believe yeah. that we are merely material. I believe there's more to the universe than material. But that's a presupposition that they have and that I have. Neither one of those are quote unquote, demonstrable. Backed by, well, I disagree, not demonstrable maybe, but backed by peer reviewed research and data. Again, the experiments and the hypotheses that they, they posit tested by experiments suggest that free will is extremely limited. 
And I'm just get, I just again, you can disagree because there are there are very intelligent well, people who disagree. Free will. That's I don't fine. like to use the word free will because people get caught yeah. up in the free aspect. I don't believe that human yeah. beings are free in the sense that we can make that we have unlimited options, but I do believe that we can make a choice between the options available to us. We are influenced by things. I agree 100. percent I, I like to say it this way: It's like a car that's rolling down a hill. The gravity's pulling the car down a hill, and I can't stop it. The engine's out, but I can take the wheel and control where yeah. I go. So that that's my yeah. understanding of the way that that free will. Or, or I don't like to call it free will, but the agency is agency yeah. is the ability to steer the car. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So back to, um, uh, you, I'm trying to think offhand. You, you said something like, um, the, the child predator, what, what do we do with them? Like they're not doing anything wrong. They're just doing what their brain tells them to do and they don't have agency. So they're just doing it. Well, well, I'm saying, I'm a, saying is, is that there is no, there is no such thing as wrong. That's a myth. Yeah. They're only doing, they're just a chemical reaction reacting to the other chemical forces on them. And so therefore for you to hold any sort of a, an anger at them for just doing what they were programmed to do, it's no, it's like you getting angry at a lion for killing a gazelle. Yeah. Yeah. So I a hundred percent agree with you that my anger comes from a place of ego in my mind. I don't. I do get angry at such things, but anger is misplaced. 100% agree with you. The reality for me is, again, totally subjective, but also agreed upon by almost all human beings, is that when someone is doing harm to somebody else, especially to that degree, that we have societal boundaries that then place that person outside the reach of other victims that they can do harm to. And and that's the best we can do in the world that we have. But but my thing is, is that the moral outrage that you're saying, like, like you can say, this is what, you know, this person did X, this group of people did Y. This was yeah. all determined by the great cosmic chemical reaction that's going on here. No one's making any choices in this at all. And what you're left with isn't any sort of a, there's no morality in that. It just is what's happening, right? The mm -hmm. morality posits this idea that we can do otherwise. Because if you can't do otherwise, then it doesn't make any, you know, if Brigham Young couldn't help but be a racist and believe the things that he believed based on his social conditioning, and you can only believe what you believe based on your social conditioning, you dissolve the entire concept of not only moral truth, but the concept of truth at all, the only, I guess the only truth there is, is that you're a chemical reaction playing itself out according to the laws of nature. And I guess what I'm saying is, is that. Couldn't that be true though? I mean, isn't it, isn't it, again, I know you believe in God, but isn't it possible there is no God? I don't believe. And that I, things. I, I do not believe it is. I, I can believe that there's a possibility that there is no God, but I cannot. Does science I can't have an explanation? There is no explanation for human agency. There's nothing. There's no explanation. No, Hold on a minute. That hu there's um, human agency is is as real as reality itself. In my opinion, there's nothing more real than my ability to make a choice because it's you're calling it human agency. But I can show you that animals are making the same sorts of decisions. So now it can't be human agency. Well, it has to be say, something. Let's else. just say agency. I don't. I don't necessarily disagree okay. with the fact that animals have some some level of agency as well. But it's it's uh, 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 very close to art. They don't have the stories we have to apply to it. But the chimps, in terms of how they treat each other and how they act is very comparable to the same sorts of behaviors we humans do. The only difference is we apply a narrative to it. Okay. Okay. So and animals, animals may have, have agency. whatever, agency maybe they have, have animals have the same degree of agency yeah, to some, to the same sort of extent. I would, I would agree with that. That's, that's a, I, I do provisionally hold that view. Okay. And animals somehow arrived at having that without any grasp of religion or God at all. That they have agency. They weren't. They they were not. Let me, let me ask you. I, let me say I, I, I agree. Like I, I don't think you oh, need. Yeah. I, I I believe that you can have agency. They weren't affected by the Judeo-Christian 
framing. They, they, they were not impacted by that at all, and yet they still arrive at a place where they collaborate, recip have reciprocity, but, have empathy. But you're, you're, do you see you're presupposing that that is something good rather than that is something that just is? No, I'm saying it just is, but it's why monkeys are still around and have been for as long as they have, because the only way that species of life generally survives and perpetuates is by reciprocity, empathy, collaboration. Hence, but only within if we their made own, it this far, but only within their own tribe, right? It doesn't make mm, any. No, animals are nice to other animals too. No, no, no. I no, no. They, they, they can be, but what I'm saying is, when push comes to shove you have to make a choice and it would and and if you want to go down the sort of supremacist argument like fine you know there's i think that scientifically makes sense back to the horse example right like it makes sense that you take care of your best horses the ones that are not going to make it or that are not beneficial to the tribe that they get kind of set aside and what you find is that that is the human ethic throughout essentially all of human history until very recently i i don't need god to create morality because animals have done it too. Now you're back to going like, but you're not, yeah, but we don't know if it's you're good not morality or not, bad morality. You don't create anything. If you don't have agency, well, you're just correct. a chemical reaction playing itself out. So you're not yeah. like, you don't get to say I created this or they created that and he did the right thing and he did the wrong thing. There just mm. is what is. And Other than if there's not collaboration, reciprocity, empathy, then the species ends up dying. They don't make it. So the reason we made it this far is because we had those components and we developed those components as an act of survival. So if we didn't work together, human beings don't make it. If we're out on the African Serengeti and there's, there's 10 of us mm -hmm. and we all are selfish, we all completely selfish. We all get eaten by lions. So evolution benefited was we, our survival was benefited by the evolutionary mechanisms of collaboration. Well, there's another there's another presupposition there that 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 survival is better than non-survival, right? Sh sure, but we're here to have the conversation, and so hey, let's let's we're obviously here, so we've made it this far. <laughs> so what we're talking about, and, uh, but but the thing is, is I think there's a real another moral quandary that I get into when I explore that kind of atheist worldview is that I don't know if if it's all evolution. You know, most animals, most life suffers immensely and then it dies, and it has historically. And I think totally. it, it may continue that way and probably will, at least for the animal kingdom and things like that. And so if I use this example, if I'm on a train to Auschwitz and I'm enjoying a nice cheeseburger, I'm listening to good music and it's nice, should would it be better for us to stop the train or would it be better, I'm having a good time, so keep the train rolling. I think when we look at the entire project of life, the big picture project, there's a serious question to say, it seems to be mostly suffering and then people die. It seems like a train to Auschwitz. Just because me and you are in our privileged position as human beings who are, you know, living in this time, which is incredibly abundant, are having a fairly good go of it. You know, we're eating the cheeseburger on the train to Auschwitz. Would it make sense for us to stop the train? Is this whole thing worth it? And again, but real quick, just before you, any answer to that, this is the sort of moral questioning and reasoning that is at the heart of this. What does it mean? Is life good? What is good? Right. And my thing is, is if you say that we are just chemical reactions playing themselves out over time, mm -hmm. we don't even, we can't stop the train. We can't do anything. It just, what is, is, and that's all that's there that's is. Not <laughs> That's not true. So even without free will, the fact that somebody didn't use agency to tune in this morning, for instance, mm -hmm. as they're listening to you and I have a conversation, they are having thoughts enter their brain. Again, can't help it. They're having thoughts enter their brain about this conversation and whose point of view is making more rational sense and which one's not. But, and they're impacted in such a way that in the very next moment, they now have more tools in their tool bag to operate by that they didn't have the moment before. And so while there isn't free will in the way that uh, most people believe, yet by you experiencing life, you are changed and you are made different. Could it have been otherwise? And that change allows you... 
Say what? Could it have been otherwise? No. So if it couldn't have no. been otherwise, then nobody gets any credit in this and nobody gets any condemnation. You don't get credit for being more rational or less rational, and they don't get any credit for listening and choosing to respond the way they do. Except that in this subjective world, we've deemed that we want to reduce suffering and allow human beings to flourish, and hence we're going to create boundaries. Could, we're it, going to... could we create a world with less suffering in it? Could it be otherwise than it's going to be based on the way the chemical reaction is going to play itself out? It would be highly less likely if we try to do so in closed systems where people pretend they talk to no, God no, no. I mean, and there's no ability to criticize. I, I, the I get that. What I'm saying is, is that yeah. you're, but there's, you're presupposing agency when you presuppose that the future. We have could no be choice different. but to do that. Yeah, we can't, we can't help it. That's the way we're going to formulate the conversation. That's the language we're going to use. So I, I get it. You're trying to constantly poke at this idea that I say there's choice and there's not. I 100% agree with you. That's the way it is in terms of what prevailing in scientists sense, say. In the and sense how I that believe the world to work. Just to clarify to make sure I understand. So you are yeah. saying that the future is going to be the way it's going to be. It's determined by the way this chemical reaction is going to play itself out. And that we we don't actually alter it. We just are part of the chemical process that's playing itself out. Yes, but with the caveat that when we think we're making choices, we don't. So for instance, if, if I, if we convinced people right now through this conversation that um, everything is hopeless, it's all predestined. Don't worry about making any effort. The way that they're going to go forward and live their life is going to be completely different than if we say, Hey, you can make a difference. Get out there. And so go you do, do but, but so you do presuppose that it could be otherwise. No, no. Um, no. And again, maybe you're just not comprehending the perspective of those who say that agency is extremely limited and yet why we as a people could I try still and, act could as I try and, Could I try and steal man you for a second? Could sure. I try just steal man you? So right. you can steal man me anytime. So so this is so so if I'm getting you right, you're saying that because we're having this conversation, it will affect someone else. Um, to potentially be to to do something differently, it can change the trajectory of what they what they would have done had they not listened to this conversation, and, and that yes, and that and is that why is and that is why this conversation matters. And what we do actually matters is because what we do can alter future outcomes. Yes, but that has nothing to do with free will. Well, it is completely separate from agency or free will. And I guess what I'm, my my thing is, is if we couldn't help but choose to have this convert, like if if we were determined to have this conversation, like it couldn't have been otherwise, and that yeah. other person couldn't have chosen not to listen, and their reaction to the conversation couldn't have been otherwise, and their future actions couldn't have been otherwise, then in what sense are we actually doing anything? In what sense do we? Like we're just, yeah. if, if anything at best, we're observers to a chemical reaction playing itself out, deluding ourselves with the ideas of these myths that what we do actually matters and impacts future states of the world when it doesn't. Yeah. Uh, yes and no. So again, with the caveat that pain hurts, emotional pain hurts, physical pain hurts, and while, um, and do you think we can actually alter the amount of pain that's going to be in the future in the world? Uh, I think my determined effort that isn't based in free will to continue to have conversations and to shine a light on things that I think are unhealthy to me shows the evidence that I am reducing suffering in the world. And hence I get the feedback that motivates. Um, the trouble is at this point, you're, you're essentially, you're pushing back against any time that I use agency as if we have it versus also saying we don't have free will. Well, I guess, I, I guess I would say my, my point, my, my point yeah. in this, just, just to try and like clarify 
why I'm bringing this up and the connection here is yeah. because if we're going to talk about morality at all in any yeah. sort of a meaningful sense, I don't understand how morality as we conceptualize it as human beings exists if ultimately, yeah. you know, a Coke can fizzing is a chemical reaction. It's just going to play itself out. There's no morality in that. It's just doing what it does. A Coke can doesn't feel things. And so I, I feel, again, my subjective position is that I feel obligated to reduce suffering in the world. Now, I may be determined in doing that, and yet something in my brain tells me to keep doing it. And so I'm going to keep doing it. Mm -hmm. And I feel subjectively that such is of benefit to, because humans, because they, they're different than other animals, their degree of sentience uh, with language, and also to some species, which most animals do, but not all, to some species have a central nervous system, we feel things, things hurt. Having people deal with pain, you can go like, oh yeah, it's, you know, we're just chemical reactions. That's fine. That's true. But I don't use it the way you use it. And a person, I simply would disagree and, with you. And, and you would say, to kind of stand in here, that a person who reduces the amount of suffering in the world is doing something good. And a person who increases the amount of suffering in the world is doing something bad. And that creates sort of a moral barometer for goodness and badness. I guess my only thing is... is That's entirely subjective. I, I would look at that and say, but you can't control the future states of the world are already predetermined. The amount of suffering that's going to be is mm -hmm. what's going to be. And so it my my thing is, is that it dissolves this idea of of morality as any sort of a meaningful concept because only moral no. agents can be morally good or morally bad. No, when people believe they have the ability to choose, they will lead a different track of life than if they're convinced they have no choice. And those two tracks of life end up with completely different results, moving the needle in two completely different directions. And uh, hence, there can it's possible there could be no free will. And yet people believing that they are making choices motivates them to do things in the world they wouldn't have done if they clearly understood they didn't. But they can't choose whether or not they believe that. No, but a conversation such as today can set them off on a different track versus had they not tuned in, right? And of course, like you're saying, they had no choice but to tune in. But something moved. Had they not watched it, they would have gone off in one direction and now watching it, they have new thoughts in their head and they're now able to make, they're now able to act in different ways. I see. Yeah. Yeah. And I and I and I may disagree in the sense that it, it still seems like a chemical reaction, but I don't think we're going to resolve that. So I think we're starting no, no. to get close here towards the end. So so let's let's yeah. And with... I think we're starting to walk circles around each other. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Why don't I give you a couple of minutes? And, and I'm happy to go first if you'd prefer that. But I'll give you a couple of minutes if you want to say anything to the audience. And by the way, I enjoyed this conversation thoroughly. Yeah, me too. Um, I'm deeply appreciative of it, and I really I I couldn't be happier with it. Um give you a few minutes if you want to share anything with the audience who's listening. And like I said, I'm happy to go first and then I'll share a couple thoughts and then let's close this out for today. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I guess the main thing that I'm, uh, th the perspective that I brought in here to kind of sum things up is that as I look at this conversation uh, as a Latter-day Saint is that I see, and not only as a Latter-day Saint, but as a Christian is I see people bringing moral criticisms to the church. And, and to some extent, I can, I can agree with certain moral criticisms that are made. I don't believe that the church or Christianity or Christians generally are, are perfect. Um, my, my deeper question, though, as I've gone and deconstructed things myself to examine you know, what's, what holds and what doesn't, is I get down to where I'm asking myself, okay, but there's a presupposition when I'm making a moral judgment that there is a moral standard that this other person that I'm talking to is obligated to adhere to when I say that. If I say, Bill, you shouldn't hit your wife, there's an, there's a, a there's a standard that I'm appealing to outside of myself and you saying you are accountable to behave according to this particular standard. 
right? And so when I see people making moral truth claims, saying that racism is wrong or something else is wrong, I'm, I often want to understand what is the basis for that moral truth claim that they've made? Because if they don't have a basis for that, you know, it's sort of like they cut off the branch that they're, they're standing on. And so before I make any moral judgments of any kind, I first need to examine where do my moral sentiments come from? Do I have a rational basis for the moral language that I'm using so that I can feel integrity in making moral judgments on other people? And that's kind of the, the way that I, and anyway, I wanted to have this conversation to sort of explore that, uh, you know, some of those deeper questions about the basis of, of anyone's moral worldview. Yeah. So my concluding thoughts are in my mind, I see that there's three options. Option one is that there is a God, that he's good, that he uh, is able to uh, send out his ideas to other humans who have placed themselves in positions of authority or who he's chosen as positions of authority. And that those people, because we don't have anything beyond sort of the non tangible. We don't have any way to like really see God face to face as a, as a general rule. There are some folks who claim they've seen him, but because most of us don't have that kind of access, we have to trust that other people are able to discern that God's mind and will to the extent that we humans are better off listening to those authorities inside those systems to get God's ideas about what is right what is wrong, what is good, what is not. And it, I agree with Jacob and most other religionists that that would be a beautiful perspective if that were possible. All of the data I see in any religious system shows that at best they are hit or miss to the same extent that I outside of religious belief am. And at worst, some of these systems are closed loop systems where nothing can be challenged exactly and unhealthy attitudes, rules, morals are allowed to persist over long periods of time without getting corrected to the point where the institution that claims that it has access to God actually ends up being generations behind the world who it claims doesn't quite have that access to God. And in my own personal life, I have found that I arrive at an idea that seems healthier to me on the front end and then is verified by the very closed loop system that then confirms at a later point, it too now agrees with me to the point where I have learned over the last 10 years, 15 years maybe even as much as 20 years, to trust my own inner authority, my own conscience, my own intuition over any other person or system that claims that it speaks for God. And while I agree with Jacob that it is subjective, yet evolution has brought us to this moment where we are more than ever before being aware of other humans all across the planet and other species of life and beginning to value them as we value ourself or our own tribe. And that if this world uh, reverts back or falls apart or human life comes to an end as we know it, it almost certainly will be because of ethnocentricity and tribalism and not because smart, wise people got together and tried to figure out how to better treat each other. Jacob, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And I, I really thank do you, hope we have more of these on other issues. Yeah. I think folks would will have deeply have enjoyed this. And uh, I hope we do it again. All righty. Well, thank you very much, Bill. Okay, have, take have it have easy. Bye-bye. Nice All right, that's it, my friend.